Welcome back for another OG show live. Mr. Randall, how you doing? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Real Down. Welcome back to another episode of Bass Fishing for News. Hi, boys and girls. Welcome to, once again, the Bass Kayak oh, Brother. Brother! This is the final cast. Another segment of uh, Chasing the Tide, your saltwater connection on the Palatine. Welcome Market. back, everyone. Another episode of Feather and Fur. Your host, Brad. Welcome back to the Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher. Hey, welcome back to Off the Water. Happy you here with Adventures of Outdoor Woman Podcast. Hey, guys. Welcome to the Rusty Hook Kayak Fishing Podcast. We're brought to you by Pelican Built Tough. For all situations, go to pelican.com. Eastport Marina on the beautiful shores of Dale Hollow Lake. For all your lodging, kayaking, go to eastport.info. Yak Gadget. For all your fine kayak fishing accessory needs, go to yakgadget.com. Welcome back to another episode of Bass Fishing for Noobs here on the Paddle and Pin Podcast. I am your co-host, Sean. And I'm Suze Q. Welcome back, Susie. Welcome, Sean. How's your week and weekend been so far? Not too bad. I uh, um, I got to fish the uh, Native Big Bass event yesterday, so I wish I would have done better, but it was still fun. <laughs> Um, well, that's good. Anytime I can spend a day on the river is definitely a good time. Uh, if I had to do it over again, I probably would have went to a place I knew a little better. I tried a new spot, and yeah, it uh, it didn't uh, work out great for me. But but you know, like I said, I, it was still fun, and I learned a, a different section of the river that I'd never fished before. So awesome! Uh, yeah. How about you? Did you? Uh, uh, I see your. Uh, making progress with the she shed and uh... Uh, yeah so um this past uh past couple of days i've been uh, doing more outside stuff uh we have a fire pit now so uh we uh nice. you know use that for the first time last night it was a perfect night for it and everything so it was awesome we had a couple friends over last night had some uh smoked burgers on the the smoker and whatnot so Nice. It's been great. And then today I've started painting the floor a little bit. So it's it's coming along. It's coming along. <laughs> Is it fumey in there? I like if you start not to, really, like, you know, I only did like I did just like a little bit of a section just to kind of see what it would look like and just to make sure, you know, that I was like, all right, am I gonna like this? But I also ran into a problem when I opened up one of the paint cans and stirred it up. Like the bottom of it was just like this weird sludge. I'm like, yeah. this isn't normal. So I went to Ace, which is like literally in our backyard, and I uh, had them shake both cans up because uh, there was only one of them that was weird. Hmm. And it was still weird. So I'm just going to take it back and, you know, get a new can or whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, once I get the floor painted and then get the top coat on that, I'll uh, start moving the rest of things in and put things in their proper place. Cool, cool. Um, yeah. I did see uh, just right before I went on the air, I saw you uh, had a post about the Noobs uh, tournament. So that. Sure did. Yep. We've uh, our September winner here was uh, Tom Arntz. Uh, so, and I know he was thinking that he was the winner as well. So we finally got all cut up with ju judging for that. And uh, yeah, we're going to have the new championship over the course of uh, five different days. But uh, the trick to this one is, is you can only choose one of those days to fish. So it'll be uh, really fun to see. So uh, that'll start uh, the 19th of October and go through the 23rd and then we'll crown our 2022 noobs champion. <laughs> nice, nice. So congrats to everyone who made it into that. And uh, remember the 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 guy who wins that, or uh, I'm not sure. Is there or lady, like yep, there is say, a lady. I thought so, I thought so. So whoever wins that will get uh, an invite to uh, hang with us next year at Dale Hollow. So, mm -hmm. so definitely uh, looking forward to seeing who uh, comes out on top there, and uh, good luck to everyone who will be fishing that. So. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> uh, well, um, tonight I, I wanted to take a chance, uh, take a moment out to, um, I'll explain how I uh, uh, came in contact with this uh, angler. Um, I was actually looking through, um, looking at my the sad shape of my uh, kayak fantasy team, on the uh, paddle and fin. Uh, I did not have a great year. I did much better last year when you couldn't change your anglers, where you basically had the same five all year. Uh, having to change it up, I definitely, uh, definitely did not handle that as well. So, 
but I was looking at the top 10 and I actually just started going down through the list and um, reaching out to them uh, to see uh, if anybody wanted to come on and talk any technique specific stuff. And um, lo and behold, uh, Ryan Matalevich uh, reached out and said, yeah, I'll come on and talk to you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Ryan to the new show. Welcome, Ryan. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Not bad. I, thanks. No problem. I'm glad. Uh, thanks for accepting the invitation. And um, for the, any of the folks who don't know, um, don't know you or uh, might not be familiar with you, um, Ryan was on the show a couple years ago on um, on uh, the Real Down, uh, talking about probably a tournament win. I'm guessing um, that's what they're the tournament shows uh, generally about. So, uh, but this is the first time on the Noob Show. Um, so, why don't you give the folks uh, who don't know you just a quick introduction? You know who you are, where you're from, how you got into uh, fishing and kayak angling. Sure. Yeah. My name is Ryan Matalevich, um, as you just mentioned, and I'm from northeastern Pennsylvania. I'm located up on like the Susquehanna on the north branch up in the Tonkanic area. Um, I got into kayak fishing about four years ago now, I'm assuming it is. Um, and I always grew up fishing and stuff, local farm ponds, but I never took it really serious or anything. And um, my dad kind of got a niche for him, was having fun doing the, the kayak thing. And um, so I kind of pursued it a little bit. We just dabbled and thought, oh, yeah, we got these kayaks now. We got these cool kayaks. Well, when we take a run. So first place we ever actually went was Kentucky Lake. That was like our very first tournament for like the – and that was a long haul, right? But And we did absolutely terrible. <laughs> we, did. <laughs> we did. I think we caught maybe one or two fish a day. It was not a great, great deal. And I was still kind of doing like what I was used to, and I never really fished a big body of water like that. Um, and then we, we, could, we didn't do great, but we had a good time. And, um, then we ended up going up and fishing. It was, I can't remember the name of it, the Queen City. It was the, that one Hobie. It wasn't a Hobie event. It was um, an event up in on Lake St. Clair. Um, like the. Uh, like a- yes, what is that called? Um, I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. Um, Border City Classic. That's what it was. Yeah, Border City. Yep. Yep. yep so. <laughs> And we did good. We caught. We were hammering largemouth, and we got smoked again by by people out throwing smallmouth and stuff. And uh, we just didn't know the lake, and we just found some back end stuff. We're like, oh wow, this is doing well. So we were catching good fish, and then we kind of ventured out into open water. And I remember my dad pulled up a really good smallmouth, and then I thought I had a world record, and it turned out to be a big old drum. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we had fun, and then we said, oh, we we that was just like kind of like a random thing. And the next day, we year we said, why don't we try to do some of this KBF stuff? So um, I started fishing kayak bass fishing events and then we we did I, I ended up doing like okay i had some real close i didn't have a top 10 my first year in the kbf so um but i had some close calls and then um the second year i started really putting stuff together and i started getting that's when i won on the lake george event um and uh i just started kind of figuring it out from there i just kind of continued to just work on it and become more and more obsessed and um now i mean we fish probably uh, man, I'd probably say like 10 to 15 major events a year um, from KBF to Hobie. Uh, haven't done any bass mainly because um, they're just not in our area. Um, the, the KBF has been most friendly to the Northeast, so that's why we've kind of grown there. And I'm just getting a little lazy to pedal on the Hobie. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I, I enjoy my, my autopilot, that's for sure. <laughs> We can definitely tell you've uh, been pretty successful just looking at your back wall there. Um, and if uh, people are just listening into this, uh, he's got like four or five stacks high and then rows of checks from KBF events. And then he's got some sweet trophies in the background, too. So uh, he's uh, definitely uh, made some uh headway and uh, placed uh, pretty high in some of those KB events. So Good to you, man. That's awesome. Yeah, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I mean, really, it's like I said, that they, they kind of came later in the game. And it's a lot of it, especially, I know, this is a bass fishing for noobs channel. But um, I mean, you're just not sometimes you can go out there and have a really good tournament stuff, but you can't get discouraged. You got to keep signed up, keep going out there. And I mean, um, listen to these podcasts is a great start. Just listen to other people and um, learning as much like I'm like a sponge and like, I don't care if you've been fishing. Like I see a 10 year old kid on the bank, I'll learn something from him. Um, it's just, I just take as much information as I can to try to, to try to like learn my craft and even more, you know, I was just talking to somebody about that this weekend that, um, yeah, you, uh, that even if you're talking to someone who, uh, you know, doesn't have any tournament experience or, or something like that, like 
you can still learn something like that. They might have a, just a slightly different way of working a technique that really mm -hmm. works for them. And it might be something that you never even thought of. And, you know, you know, that I'm, I'm the same way. And that's kind of why I started, you know, uh, came on this show is because I, I figured it would be as much a learning experience for me as it is uh, being able to teach other people. Um, but yeah, I, I totally echo that a hundred percent. But um, I wanted to give you a chance. Um, obviously, uh, when I found you on, on the top of our fantasy list, um, I knew that you had had a pretty successful year to this point. But uh, why don't you talk a little bit about how your year has gone, you know, uh, you know, the, the successes you've had and kind of where you've been and how you've done. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to look to the left here just to kind of go through. I had a list pulled up of, of events from this year just so I can recall them. Um, my season started off in Kissimmee. Um, I was fishing down the Kissimmee chain and, uh, that was a KBF event where they had the temptational and the 10 and all that stuff. And for anybody that doesn't know about that event, there's a lot of water and a lot of different lakes. And, um, Florida is the kind of place where you're fishing those chains and you get out there and you'll be like skunk and like not catching a fish. And then you'll like be in the same spot and you'll see like a 60 year old lady with a sun hat on the boat, just pulling up 10 pounder after eight pounder with on Live oh. shots and it just kind of doing a, it makes, it's, it's a tough deal, you know. Those fish, are, they, they know that a shiner is a shiner and a kitex a kitex. I'll tell you that. Um, but uh, that's where I started. I, I didn't have a great finish. Um, I think I finished like in like like the in 43 43rd or something like that. Um, I figured something out late on and I kind of started putting it together. But day one, I was not doing so hot and there was a lot of wind and stuff. And I started getting on a bite down there that um, had me actually go aha so again takeaway from that is that i have a much better idea going down again this year um as to what i'm going to do and i'm hoping to finish a lot better than that um then we obviously we moved on to lake murray um i finished seventh in the pro series there seventh in the trail two and then like 20th or something on day one um overall and that was uh my second time to lake murray again the first time i didn't do as hot um, but then I just took some of the information I gathered and what I was doing and what was working and just kind of put it together. And that's a lot of these lakes. And you see these consistent anglers is just being able to go and um, actually learn from your experience. Like a lot, it's, it's really easy to go there in the beginning and just get smoked and look at it from a negative perspective, perspective to say, hey, look, I can't figure this out. This sucks. I don't know what these guys are doing. There's some in some weird spots. You can get negative about it or you can try to put together like, OK, I didn't do real good. But like what was working, what the, did do well and maybe get to the events and talk to some people and just kind of take a little bit of tips away. Try the next time. See what happens, you know, and if you do that three or four times, you're going to start moving up and doing better. It's just it's a guarantee, you know, a lot of these places, they, they, are, they fish good. Um, are, I'm sorry. They fish the same way year to year when you're in the same seasons, you know, um, sometimes there's some variation and it changes. I wouldn't say get locked up on a spot or something. Um, but you kind of get an idea as to what these fish are eating, what they're biting on, what they're not biting on, things like that. Um, so Lake Murray was pretty good. Potomac was a really good event. I finished in ninth on day one, second in day two, and then second, I think in the pro series, um, that was, a really good event for me this is the second year i've had a good event at the potomac and um i fish a lot different than a lot of other people do um it's typically a, a power fishery like grass fishery things like that i mean there's a lot of a lot of water and i kind of use some finesse tactics to do well there um and then moving on mesolonski i finished second and first or second on trail one fifth on trail two and i i think first in the pro series on that one um and that was um uh, that was a small mouth spawn event um, up on Mesolonsky. They're all like, wow. it was like, crazy. Everybody was hammering them up and they didn't have other lakes open. Like normally when they do the main lakes, they had like Mesolonsky and great pond open. So it opened up the water. So there's like a pretty big field there. And like Mesolonsky is a pretty small lake. Um, so, I mean, these fish were getting hammered. They're on the shoreline. They were, <laughs> they, they were <laughs> literally like littered, like around there. They was like full on spawn and, um, they were getting caught three or four. It was like people were trading like fish on that tournament. I feel like Pokemon cards, like you'd see English. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was, it was just funny, the comical. And the, and the truth of the whole thing is out of, um, my 10 fish, I think that maybe four, three of them were actually bed fish. Um, I kind of got on something. Everybody else was on the shoreline and I was out in the middle catching fish that were chasing shad and like catching post spawn fish our pre-spawn nice. fish whether they were getting ready to move up and um i was catching a lot on the top water um out in the middle of the lake when everybody else was just 
bed fishing and kind of like trying to beat the bank with them, you know, and when it got and the, and the thing about bed fishing is if you can't adapt, um, you get a lot of guys that are doing that and they can kind of have all these waypoints on these fish. And then the, 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 the bad thing about that is sometimes like one of the fish won't bite. You'll be spending a bunch of time on it. Those fish up there, they, 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 they didn't care. You can get <laughs> the road, but, um, that will happen. And then also what really hurts is you get like overcast and cloud cover and rain and wind. And then all of a sudden, like what you were trying to do becomes really, really challenging, you know? So um, it can be cool. I mean, it's once in a while, I don't mind doing it. I'm not a huge fan of uh, being on a, like a, a bed fishing type event all the time, just because it's one, it's hard on the fish, I think, and they get really beat up. And then two, it's just, um, I don't know. It's a little, it's, I, I, I just like traditional fishing a little bit more. Um, then we moved up to Champlain. I was sixth on day one and fifth on day two. And I think second in the trail are the pro series on that one um that was another similar story uh there's a lot of bed fish going on there at the champlain event um there was some that i was catching pre-spawn post-spawn but the majority of those fish i was catching bed fishing um uh, difference is it wasn't really sight fishing bed fishing because you were there was a lot of fish that were um not really visible with the water color and a lot of the wind and the conditions we had at that event um it kind of was almost like they're just kind of like flipping banks on spots that you would think would be like high percentage spots. And that's kind of how I approached that event. Um, then we went into Lake Winnipesaukee. Um, that was, I got a fourth and a second there. That was straight on summer fishing. It was literally offshore. I think that was a second, the pro series too, but that was, um, I mean, anybody that watches any of the KFL stuff or anything and watches like Winnipesaukee, man, that place just puts out smallmouth, man. I mean, there's, you, I, I literally had an electrical tape, my thumbs and my, <laughs> they, they were I, st I still, I mean, I don't know if you can see, I still don't really have a fingerprint left on my finger. Like it wore it off that bad. Oh my uh, gosh. I, I was catching, like we were catching 20 to 50 fish a day. It was, oh. just one oh. after it was just, and, th and those fish for whatever reason, I mean, Susky fish can be, they cooperated a lot. I was at the Susky event that you mentioned <laughs> earlier. They weren't really too feisty um, this time around. Uh, but those fish, for whatever reason, they're straight shad eaters up in Winnipesaukee. Our smallmouth on <clears throat> the Susquehanna, they're eating crawfish, so they have worn down teeth and, and things along those lines. Um, the ones that you get in Winnipesaukee, they don't eat crawfish, apparently. I mean, they have them up there. People say that they do, but I think for the most part, the fish I was targeting literally are like straight shad eaters. And, uh, um, man, it was uh, – smelt is actually what they're eating up there, sorry. Uh, but it's uh, – it was unreal and their spines for whatever reason were like razor like razor wire like it one of those and they were like grenades they're all excited and they'd be bouncing around the boat and <laughs> just from like them straight like the sandpaper like just wiping my thumbs out like because i'm telling you it was way different than normal smallmouth and their spines like my hands were so bloody and bad oh. it was it was unreal so if you're fishing up there wear gloves and put electrical tape on your fingers <laughs> So that was pretty much my trail. I mean, a couple of those were EKF events that I had. We had Winnip or we had the KFL games as well that I fished with the Pennsylvania Bronzebacks. Um, and but for the most part, this year was focused, with exception of the um, Susquehanna event that we just finished, which was this Saturday, which was a pretty good showing. I mean, it was a native uh, big bass power hour. We had I think 130 some anglers, something like that. Yeah, like 131 or 32. Yeah, somewhere along. <laughs> yeah. and I ended up. <clears throat> that was a kind of a weird format for me um, because it was your big fish every hour um, paid out a thousand dollars. And then they had like an MLF style where it was like your most inches overall. And I ended up getting fifth overall um, with submitting the fish, but I didn't end up winning an hour. So um, payouts weren't as good. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, but I mean, it goes for like, it was a cool event, right? Cause it's not like, some of those guys I, with the leaderboard, I'm like forward against the kind of at the same time because you'll fish an event and if you are not really on something you're super confident in and you start looking at it and see somebody's putting up a huge bag right at the beginning of the day, it's kind of defeating and you're like, oh man. And some people even leave early, which I strongly am like totally against. Like, I mean, if you're not, if you, if you have no chance of winning or don't think you have a chance of winning, you need to still keep fishing and try to figure out how you have to win next time. And that's just a right. real big tip you can give to people. Quitting the day and leaving early just because you don't think you have a chance to win is not going to teach you anything except poor sportsmanship and like you're not going to learn from it. Yeah, I, I, I am. I'm always amazed when I, I see people heading to the ramps early. I'm like, you know, 
you know, you paid to be in this event. You might as well, you know, fish right. it out yeah. and at least learn something. But, yeah. but you're right. And that was the weird thing about uh, the uh, the event yesterday was, you know, you in that last hour, you still had a shot at big bass yep. for that hour. So there was no reason to quit, you know? Yeah. And I, the weird, yeah. That, I mean, not to cut you off, sorry, but the weirdest thing, I had a 19.5 the first hour, right? And um, it ended up being someone won with like, I think they had that 20 or whatever, the 20, 21 maybe that was caught the first hour. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up beating then someone, I think hour four or five won with like an 18 something. So <laughs> I had, I had a big fish, but it didn't count because of the hour. So right. personally um, to native, I, I think it, I would like the structure a little bit better. I think if they did maybe the, the biggest, just eight fish overall and paid out like hour, like paid out and that as opposed to like hourly, um, not only for like, obviously it would help me out, but um, just in the sense of like, if you do catch a big one, like you have, like you feel confident about it, you know, it's, it's just, I mean, if you catch a 19.5, like that's no, like not another shake of stick. I should feel good about it. It just sucks if someone caught a 19.5 10 minutes before you. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, I fished a, um, a, a kayak anglers, a central PA event on the Juniata this year and uh, middle of the, uh, probably nine o'clock, I caught a 21 inch fish. Uh, and I was like, oh, I got big bass for this tournament that nobody catches 21 inch fish in these little tournaments like that. Yeah. And one guy caught 21 and a quarter and beat me for big bass. I was so mad. I was like, come on, I finally caught a huge bass in this. And uh, I still didn't win big bass, but that's how it goes, I guess. Yep. So, but it was definitely a cool format. I appreciate them for coming out and like throwing it on. Like it was definitely something cool to do in October. I mean, there's not a lot of fall tournaments. Everybody's getting an archery season, which just started in Pennsylvania. And I and speak duck hunting. Did you have yeah. a lot of duck hunters? Yeah, Holy yeah, crap. There's, a, there's a lot of ducks out there. Feared for my life at, at, at first light, man. I, you know, I started paddling up, heard shotgun shots, yeah. turned and paddled the other way, heard shotgun shots that way. I'm like, ah. Oh. Yeah, they were flying all over the place too, the ducks, and uh, that's crazy. I, I mean, I just, I'm not, I don't really follow like the duck, the duck season or anything along those lines too much. I would assume that there was going to be a little bit less action on the river because of the the archery season starting, but it's a little early for that. The buck aren't really in full rut and stuff, and they're just uh, a lot of guys kind of wait till um, a little bit later in October to get on that. Right. Nice. So I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit because something kind of piqued my interest as you were talking about your season so far this year. Uh, you were talking about uh, Kissimmee and how you had like that aha moment, you know. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Um, yeah, so I mean, I was, uh, and I don't want to steer anybody wrong, but um, a lot of guys were doing good like with with, with big swim baits and they were doing good with um, like chatter baits and I mean, lipless crankbaits, which I mentioned isn't like a strong suit of mine, but it does really well down there. Um, but I ended up like, I'm, again, I'm more of a finesse style fisherman. Um, I don't mind doing it, but I was a little wore out. I'll tell you after the Susquehanna throwing that chatterbait all day, like my hands, I'm like, man, this is, this is rough for the wrist. <laughs> you know, Cause I was just chucking on. Cause again, I'm for, for anybody that knows me, I'm super passionate, super about it. And I mean, I don't think I could have made another cast if I tried to. Um, I literally am all day, all day, just going and gunning. And that's how you have to be, man. Cause any second like matters. But when I was down there, I was just in, and, and again, this kind of goes back a little bit to me talking about, you can learn something from anybody, yeah. you know, and I was fishing it and, uh, I was just throwing everything and I was catching a couple fish and in, in the area I was in and, I was just catching them doing different stuff. Like I, I actually caught one on a flicker shed and like little crankbaits and I was doing stuff like that. And um, then my bike kind of shut off a little bit. And um, I had an old guy, he was an older guy just hanging on the boat. And he was just said, uh, he just came up and he just started like, like blasting him next to me and he was artificial fishing and stuff. And just doing traditional stuff that everybody kind of gets over complicated, like thinking like you need all these special colors, special baits and everything. And I just looked, I'm like, man, what are you doing? What are you, you're tearing them up. What are, what's going on here? What am I not doing? And <clears throat> this was not during the tournament. It was during like practice. Um, I think. Yeah. And then he goes, no, it was, it was during the first day of the tournament actually. And um, he was just an old guy. He just looked at me all nonchalantly. He's like, you just better be, you got to be dragging that worm. And he was just like, also, like <laughs> I just started dragging a worm super slow. And they just, I started cracking them. I was doing really good with that. Um, but again, I think that all comes down to is the biggest thing about fishing, right? Is you got to have like, I'm probably at about 10 combinations that I have that I'm super comfortable with and confident with. I've caught fish on and I use them. And then I try to use them in 
the right situations, right? So I catch fish on a jig and it's great when I'm in rock and that's how I fish a jig. I know guys fish them in grass and things. And for me, being a Northern angler, that's what makes me confident. And I know like, I don't ever throw those giant jigs with the big craw trailers and stuff. I know guys down South kill them on those kind of things sometimes, but for me, it's just, I don't have any confidence doing that. So um, I like throwing like little finesse jigs and doing stuff like that, but I'm usually like a football jig kind of guy. And if it's not rock and I can't make that happen, um, I don't use that technique. Not that that doesn't get bit. And I think that's where a lot of people get lost is they think like, oh, this is my good bait, but you really got to get used to like where you're fishing that bait. And then what they're biting, if they're biting it, like what are, what's going on there? Is there like, what time of year is it? Is it like, why are they biting it there? And then every time I catch a fish, like I literally try to run through my mind, like why, what, when, where, what's going on here? Let's like, what kind of structure is going on and just try to figure that out and like put it in like your data log as to what's going on, you know? Um, and then color means a little bit, but I think for the most part, it's like presentation, right? You got the top of the water, middle of the water, and then like on the bottom and then like your different structures. And you just got to figure out which baits that you have confidence in, in those particular structures and try to get that down to like a, a confidence thing um, to a, a certain amount of, of tech techniques, I guess you would say in rods. Um, but I don't like to get, I, I did. So I started out, like I said, not knowing anything and, I went from one stream extreme to the other with tackle. Like I had very like inexpensive rods and like I had very like whatever. And then I decided to like, I started like getting a little bit more into it. And then I went like way off the deep end, like buying like super high end tackle and like thousands of different things, watching all this stuff and videos and baits and all these people are pushing their sponsors and different stuff and buying all these different baits and approaches and um, all these different, like 15 different kinds of square bills. Like, look at that. It's like, completely excessive. <laughs> you don't need to do that you know it's it's really more so about like what square bill do you like then like throw that square bill you know what i mean like and same thing with like a top water find a couple top waters that you like and then just keep a couple of them if anything you'd be more suited in my mind buying a couple of the same top water as opposed to buying five different ones because then you have a backup if you break that one off and you're not confident like, oh, I broke that one off and I only have five other ones that don't look anything like it. And they're not going to bite that <laughs> one. It just it gets all spun out and it's just not really necessary. You know, just like I said, I mean, I keep it very simple. I keep a bait on the bottom, one in the middle. And then like I just keep one on top and um, like obviously some dragging baits and like a like a reaction style bait and just try to keep it simple. And the more you kind of simplify and the more you find stuff that you're confident in and fish to your confidence, that's the strongest thing. If you're confident in it, I might say throw a buzz bait with a gold blade and you're going to say, oh, no, I like to throw a buzz bait with a silver blade. And there's a good chance we'll probably catch the same amount of fish on it either way. So just throw it when you're confident and don't worry about what the other guy's doing because um, you go to these tournaments, you're like, start watching all this. You like people go to tournaments down south, for instance, I'm going to Kentucky Lake. If I started watching what all these guys or catch them on down there and like i don't ever throw and like baits that i don't throw i'll go down there i've done it and i will do terrible i won't catch fish i won't have confidence it won't be anything but if i just go down there and fish like i do up north and fish like my confidence and what i'm comfortable in i will excel and do better and that's just how it goes and it doesn't always work out i mean i i do well in these tournaments all year but i can go down there and do bad historically i've actually been like a omen for me i've done um really well the past two years in a row where i was like top 10 in aoi and kbf going into the national championship and i just had a bad event two years in a row so hoping hoping three is the magic number and i don't do it again but um it's just uh like i said the, the biggest thing i the biggest takeaway i learned is just really stick to what you're confident not, not saying don't expand into something different but you don't have to get caught up in having like like a super fancy anything you don't have to have like unlimited amount of money like you really just need to kind of keep it like basic especially in the beginning beginning keep a rod that you were confident in and like i said like three rods you have like a like a finesse rod like something like maybe something to flip and like throw a little jig around in with something like that like a top water rod and um if you want to throw in like a react like a chatter bait that you can tie on the spinner bait on or whatever you know um you literally could go out there 90 percent of the time i got to these tournaments i only need um i end up using one rod maybe two or three at the maximum it's usually i take a lot with me just so again i have the confidence thing so i can kind of break it down and figure it out and usually that's more so in practice and then by the time i fish the tournament i kind of lock down the thing right because what you're throwing and what's winning the tournament isn't the only thing you can catch fish on you can catch fish on a variety of different stuff um you you're best suited to throw what you're confident and confident in and just keep pursuing it from that angle I think it's uh, that's a really good point too, because uh, when I first got start got started, I kind of 
threw as much money as I could, you know, do yep. without getting divorced. We all did. You know? That's everybody. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and um, looking back now, I'm like, I wasted a crap ton of money because I, you know, I, I still have to this day tons of stuff hanging on my garage wall that I uh, maybe yep. I'll use someday. But um, yep. you know, odds right. are I'm gonna stick with that the few packs that are in my tackle box that I go with me every time or my, my black pack, you know, or my, I, my, my crate. And um, yep. I never touch that stuff on the wall. And it, so um, I, that's an excellent tip for new beginners. Just, you know, find a couple things, like you said, build your confidence and, and don't feel like just because you saw somebody on YouTube doing a, a you know, flipping a jig, like you said, with a big crawl trailer, um, you know, that that's definitely something you'll have to, that you have to do. Cause I, I, I did that. And I, I, I took it out on the Susquehanna and I'm like, I cannot catch a fish to save my life on a jig, you know? And it turns out it was just, I didn't need to be using a huge jig. I, you know, once I downsized and started, like you said, using those finesse jigs, um, I really, you know, had better luck and um, it was just definitely a, a learning experience. So I think that's definitely a good point uh, for anybody just getting into this is to, to kind of, I know it's hard because you're super excited about this new <laughs> new thing that you found, but um, don't feel like you have to, you know, break the bank and and try everything you see a YouTube video on. So yeah, I, I would I would basically say, man, if you're going out and you're trying to get a uh, get going, like get yourself. If you had to buy like three rods, which would be a good thing. Like you need, like I would go out, I'd get like a like a like a six six is ten to seven foot spinning rod, you know, um, medium or a medium light, something like that um you're gonna be able to throw your senkos on it a drop shot on it you can throw a jerk bait on it i've actually had this new epiphany like where now i i don't throw a jerk bait on a big caster anymore i've done it for the last three years and i literally switched and i started throwing a jerk bait on a spinning rod so um i can get it a lot deeper and um the bait will go a lot deeper and you see a lot of bait, the guys throw in um deep diving jerk baits and they're throwing them on a bait caster with 12 pound line um, you go down to like an eight to 10 pound line on a spinning rod and you can get a regular 110 mega bass jerk bait as deep as somebody on a bait cast or throwing a 110 plus one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I kind of switched to. You're not going to worry about a lot of times jerk bait. I'm throwing in the wind. Like you don't have to worry about like backlashes trying to cast mm -hmm. far into the wind. And um, you can cast a jerk bait a lot further. People argue you can cast a jerk bait a 10, like easily, easily 20% further on a spinning rod. And not have to worry about the backlashes. After watching uh, Jeff Little uh, a lot, I mean, he throw he does throw. I mean, it's not that he doesn't throw bait casters, but he does throw a lot of spinning setups. And one of the things that he does throw a lot on spinning setups is jerk baits. And um, after I saw that, I, it kind of made me rethink that whole thing. And and um, I, you know, I I am kind of similar to you. I throw a lot more finesse uh, when I go out. I usually have maybe you know four spinning rods and two bait casters with mm -hmm. me like on tournament days and and i talk a lot of the people that i talk to they're, they're like oh if i have one spinning rod that's a lot you know and yeah. um uh, but i there's so many don't, things don't that, people yeah yeah <laughs> exactly uh like there's so many things that i feel like i can do better with a spinning rod uh um, sure. so uh it, that was definitely another another eye-opening thing for me is to kind of get past that you know yeah, I mean, you watch Major League Fishing right now or, like, any kind of, like, big, like, even Bassmaster, like, a lot of money is going on a spinning rod. Um, and it's just, like, there's no question about it. But what I was saying is, like, the three rods, right, so that seven, six, ten to seven foot medium, medium light spinning rod, um, you'll be able to throw, like, the wacky rig on it, a jerk bait on it, a Ned rig on it. Um, you could literally, like, I, I, what else do I throw? Like, if you want to throw, like, a little popper, you can throw, like, a little popper mm -hmm. on it. Um, I mean, it's just such a versatile rod that you could literally catch so many different fish on. So that'd be like my first rod that I would say, right? And then the second rod that I'd be bringing would be just like a medium heavy bait caster, um, which that literally will cover you like a medium heavy fast. Um, we'll give you, you can throw like all your like little flipping baits. You can throw like a dragon, like a dragon worm. You can literally throw a jig, um, a chatter bait, a spinner bait, um, a buzz bait. Like you can throw all of that stuff, which are all like great, just down to like earth. And you look at these baits of like 10 years ago, like every single, like there's like this new greatest, best thing, which sometimes is the case, but those baits that were like hammering and winning circuits before all the fancy stuff out are still catching fish and winning circuits right now. So um, 
that would be rod number two. And then rod number three, if you wanted to be bare minimum without getting in anything else, would be basically um, I'd bring like a moderate action bait caster, um, which would be like a moderate action seven foot, something like that. And that would cover like your spooks. Um, crank going baits. With, you get your crankbaits, you know, like your lipless crankbaits, square bill crankbaits, everything like that. And those three rods would kind of give anybody getting ready to start um, the ability to do anything they want. Um, those DC reels Shimano makes are really good for learners that don't know how to throw a bait caster. Um, and anybody that is throwing a bait caster, lock that thing down all the way. Your spool, make it so like you tighten up the little tensioner spool on the side so the bait doesn't even fall. It just barely falls. And then turn your brakes up. Um, if you have the, the side piece that you can take off, I usually would recommend like if you're just starting, maybe leave three brakes on. I usually still fish with two um, and um, just keep it tight, right? Because then you can cast and you'll get the ability to the field down better for doing it. And then eventually now I've gotten to the point where I actually don't like the DC reels anymore. Like I use, I, I have more freedom with some of the other stuff. But as I was mentioning to you before we went live, I just blew one up not paying attention the other day. <laughs> my, and I and I still do that. My finger slipped as I was casting behind me and the bait wasn't up and my finger came off and I cast it and the bait was in the water behind me before it got up, you know, because I pull off the spool. So it just, it just turned ugly. Um, so, but those three rods really um, cover it up. And then a lot of it is really just, you can even double up those same rods, right? Because now that same crankbait rod, if you just double it up, you have now a crankbait and you can have a top water like a spook on. So then you got two good reels there one i'd probably end up putting braid on maybe if i wanted to or um and then leave leave the other one alone and then same thing with medium heavy then you can have like a dragon like a texas rig style bait or flipping bait and then you could have a um like i said like you could have like a chatter bait or spinner bait on the other one um so you quickly build yourself to where you're getting rods that you can adapt to a lot of stuff now i basically have like 11 different rods and probably four of them are well no actually i'm sorry so 11 different rods and i think four of them are the same spinning rod and then i have another th three that are the same crankbait rod and then like it's literally so <clears throat> when it comes to technique specific rods the only ones i really that if you wanted to get like weird on it would be like a, like a frog or um i'd have like a seven three extra heavy and i literally have 65 pound braid on that and the only thing i throw is a frog on that rod like there's really nothing else i throw with it um you could probably do some punching if you really wanted to do or something with that same rod if you wanted to um, and then your other one would be like a big 710, like medium heavy crankbait rod, you know, but that's if you're throwing oh, like, seven, like, ten, man. That's, if you're throwing, like that's, a, that's for throwing like, like I'll throw straight braid on that and throw whopper ploppers, like big one thirties on that rod. Um, and then deep diving crankbaits, you know, stuff like that. Like I'm talking like six XDs or even a little smaller. I'm talking like 10, eight XDs, 10 XDs, like the real big stuff, which, that honestly, if you're listening to that, don't even get into it because it's like comes out and plays so little that it's really probably not something worth even start. You know what I mean? So um, it's it's one of those things where you can, you're much better suited to buy an extra medium heavy rod so you can kind of keep more 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 uh, medium heavy fast seven, like I was saying, because then you have more applications. But you don't need a ridiculous amount of rods. If anything, those three will get you through 99% of the tournaments. Fish. I can't tell you that I've won one tournament where I needed a different rod than one of those three um, that I mentioned at the beginning. And like I said, duplicating them up just gives you the ability because they're all the most, the most, um, most of the most of the stuff I throw are those three particular rods. So um, it just kind of the best suggestion I could give in that in that field, you know. That's I think that's a really good suggestion. I mean, that gives you. Um, just the people getting started is, you know, three rods that they can go out and pretty much cover most of the techniques that, you know, that you're going to need or, or at least one. And then as you, you know, start to, you know, either get a bigger budget or, you know, just increase the number of rods, not necessarily the different types. I mean, because I think there's definitely something to be said for the, you know, having the same rod because you're going to know you're going to get a feel for that rod and and how it performs and. Um, you know, that's why I know a lot of the, um, pros stick to very similar, uh, setups, you know, and yep. uh, because they, they get so comfortable throwing a certain thing and, and they know how it's going to perform and, you know, it, they get almost muscle memory, um, you know, from using it to the point where they know exactly how it's going to perform. And it's not even like a question. Yep. No, no doubt. I mean, that's just, you really got to keep it simple in that aspect because I mean, there's so much, they like, I mean, look, let's face it, like bass fishing and it is a good thing is powered um, 
by like marketing and trying to sell us stuff. And um, there's a lot of stuff out there and there's so many different rods and so many different, <laughs> and so many different things that it makes it so confusing. But um, I mean, just a couple of things, just to simplify that is you got, like I said, um, moderate action rods, which has a lot more bend in the tip. So it's forgiving. So anything that's a moderate action, which is like that seven foot rod, which was the third one I mentioned, um, you want that for anything with treble hooks because it's going to load up a lot better. The fish kind of hook themselves in it. You just lean into that and then it helps them as they're jumping and flopping out of the water and frailing around. It helps them stay pinned with those treble hooks where if you throw it on like a fast action, like a heavier rod that you throw like the chatterbait on or the jerk bait on, I'm sorry, the chatterbait, sorry about that. So chatterbait or the spinnerbait on, um, a lot of times when those fish thrash, you'll rip the hooks out of their mouth. So that's the difference between like the matter moderate and the fast action. And, um, so basically to keep it simple, it's just your fast action is anything with like a big gaff single hook. Right. And then the moderate action would be anything that you have treble hooks on. No, that, that, that breaks it down about as simple as it can get. So I think that's great. Um, I know, uh, before the show, we were talking a little bit, um, you said you're basically known for the drop shot. Um, and I, I think you said probably 70% of your fish come from the drop shot. I know. Sure. Yeah. I, I, a drop shot, I would say, and just the spinning rod in general, you know, okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have, I can't think of a couple that I've, I've utilized the bait caster for. And again, that's why I said each one has its own specialty, but um, the finesse has been more of my application. So not that those other things don't serve a purpose, like the chatter bait obviously is a huge tournament winner, right? So that's not going to be something that you want to throw on a spinning rod, but the rods that I throw the most is um, it's a, it's an expensive rod, but it doesn't have to be. It's a it's a it's a uh, it's an X Pride that I throw. Um, a G Loomis, I like the G Loomis rods, and that's just a comfort thing for me. And I had some tournament winnings, and I like to dump it back into that. But um, I've also caught them just as well on a different rod. I I have I like the basically when you buy the more expensive rod, you're going to get a little bit of a better feel. But if you're throwing like a braid to leader on a spinning rod, you're going to end up having good feel on any rod that you're throwing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing is you're going to get a little bit lighter, a little bit more balanced, and it's just more comfortable to do. And I fish so much that like the light and I cast so much that the lighter, it's just not so fatiguing and it just, it's more comfortable for me to utilize. And um, I just really enjoy the rods and I'm a little bit of a, a little bit of a nut when it comes to my spinning rod just because it's been what is, done me so well so um the nrx uh is is what i'm throwing the g is nrx it's the drop shot rod um it's a 610 medium light and typically um when i start i was throwing like the 15 20 pound braid to um like a 10 pound fluorocarbon leader is what i typically have tied up on that um now if i'm tying that particular rod up with a jerk bait um, cause again, as I mentioned, that's the first rod I mentioned, um, that rod was kind of like a jerk bait. I'll still run with the braid, um, just because it's expensive to, comp cause the one thing you guys will run into is respooling. You're like, Oh, well, now I did this line, I need that line, I need this line. So, um, little tip there is just put like yourself a braid on there, like a 15 pound braid or something along those lines. As a backer. Mm -hmm. I start as a backer and I, I switched to 10 now. I use a 10 pound braid. I'm back and forth. I like it, but I also like the 15 pound. Um, so 15 pounds gives you a little bit more of a buffer to, if you want to go up to like a 12 pound or if you wanted to go to something a little bit heavier to throw like a Ned rig or something like that. So I would recommend probably go with a, on that rod, I'd say like a 15 pound braid and um, leave yourself a little bit of room. I mean, don't leave it real deep. Um, so where if you want to throw a jerk bait, you can just take 10 pounds of fluorocarbon or eight pounds of fluorocarbon or six pounds of fluorocarbon and just tie on like, like a cast length, you know, like, like, 60 yards or 50 yards or whatever you want to cast like just so you have a little bit of room there um so you're not not coming through the guides and then you can fish that and then as that line gets warped and bend it up and like gets a little rough you can just go back to the braid cut it off and then tie on a new leader and you can re-rig your rod a hundred times for the content and what you would be doing once you know because the line gets expensive i mean fluorocarbon is not cheap you know so I started doing that two years ago and it was probably one of the best decisions. The only thing, the only issue I have with that is I don't know if it's just my knots that I use or whatever, but sometimes where the two lines connect, it'll kind of click through. That's a new guide, yeah. I, yeah. I can't even think what the, I, I used to do the double uni knot and that one does get caught in the guide a little bit. Um, I switched to the, um, I can't think of the name of it. Really, to be Alberto? Honest. That's no. what I use is the Alberto. 
it's the I could tie it in front of you in like two seconds. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's just like it's this knot, whatever this is. You do the thing. <laughs> yeah, thing. but it, it, it is like a really, um, really small, thin knot. Um, I'd have to think about it and get back with you guys. But um, well, if it's, it's easy to tie, I'd be interested in learning it because I, I tried the Alberto and I just can't tie it consistently. So I went back to the double uni. But uh, yeah, no, it's not. It's not the easiest. Basically, like. I'll leave my spinning rod down and then I wrap the braid around my finger and then I'll take the fluorocarbon. I cross over back and forth like 17 times and then you have to tie the one knot around and then you pull it and then you tie it around again with like an overhead knot and pull it and then you like clinch it. It's like a clinch knot kind of and that's how it's tying the knot and then you cut off the fluorocarbon real close and you tie the do another overhead knot in the braid and cut it off. And that gives you like a really long, there's a bunch of wraps around your fluorocarbon. So basically the braids wrap around the fluorocarbon and it clenches down on the, um, on the fluorocarbon and that's how the knots held. So it's not actually tying a knot in the line at all. So it's actually supposedly has the strongest break strength of any knot, but it also does take a little bit more time to tie than a regular knot. Um, like my buddy, Nick, I mentioned, he, he does not like it just because he says it takes me too much time to tie them, but I just have confidence in it now. I like it. And it's just been what works for me. <clears throat> and again, if I can think of it, if it comes to me while I'm talking, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, yeah. But so that's the thing, right? So we're talking that 610 medium, medium light, uh, spinning rod. Um, the reel on the spinning rod, I don't get hung up with too much. The biggest thing you want there, um, I don't like a cheap reel. Um, if you're going to spend more money, I would strongly advise spending it in the, normally everybody says the rod, but in the reel on the spinning rod, just because you need something with a good drag system. Um, because on a bait caster, drag isn't really as big of a thing, right? Like, like I personally think drag just kind of sucks on a bait caster. Like most of the time <laughs> I'm on a bait caster, yep. I'm letting the rod do all the damage and I'm just trying to like get the fish in the boat and flip them in the boat or do whatever. But like, I hate playing with fish next to the boat on the bait caster on a spinning rod. It's a different story. Like small mouth, you're using small little hooks and you have to have the drag set, right. Especially if you're using like six pound, eight pound, 10 pound test, like, and you got to make sure that the fish can, you can keep that bow in the rod and get the fish back to the boat. Cause the biggest thing on the spinning rod is having your drag. So you can just hear that click, 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 as you're going, like you want to be able to feel that fish going away from it. And like, if you pull on them, like you can pull. And then as you keep that bow, it, you'll, you'll feel some of your drag peeling out. And sometimes if you're using like a clunky spinning rod reel, um, you're going to like have a tight drag where it like lets out like bursts of a little bit mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. get caught, you'll end up breaking those fish off for sure. Especially when you're talking smallmouth, which is what I fish mostly and where like most of my winnings have come from. Um, you need something with a good drag. So um, that's where I do my research if, more than anything. Again, you go with anything 610 to 7 foot, medium, medium light, you're going to be completely fine. But you're going to want something with a good drag system. So that's where I would give my best advice on. Um, is there uh, anything in particular you you stand by or you prefer? Um, I mean, I have, I, I do like, um, I'm a Shimano guy, so I have pretty much all Shimano reels. I don't think I <clears throat> throw really anything. I mean, I might have one older Abu, Abu reel that I still throw, but pretty much all the reels I throw are Shimanos. Um, I mean, for the spinning reel, I mean, there's a, the Vanford is a, is a great reel. It's a little bit... Um, pricier than the, the standard i think they're like probably like 200 dollars range something like that um but it is a great reel and they work well um and then i mean obviously it goes up from there they get crazy i know some people said that lose makes it some good ones but um i just would like again if you buy something the 200 dollars price point you'll probably be in the right area there to get something that's gonna have a decent drag system on it yeah no, and I, I think, you know, another thing that took me a little bit to learn was, you know, and it was a hard pill to swallow at first was that if you, you buy quality, you won't re have to rebuy. Whereas when I first got started, I would buy like the cheap, you know, 30, 40, $50 spinning reel or, and yep. they would burn out. They, they would just break, you know, mm -hmm. and wouldn't last more than a season. And, you know, then I started buying a little bit nicer stuff and, it really does hold up a lot better. You know, it's, yeah. it's the big thing with that though, is right. Like expensive stuff. I mean, we're kayak fishermen, people lose stuff. It falls out of the boat. It gets snagged <laughs> in a tree. You lose it. I mean, so it is tough to do, but I mean, it is right. Like you do it. So, I mean, 
if you're in like that two hundred dollar range, I mean, you're probably doing okay, and you're going to be able to, to sustain. I mean, if you have the budget and you're not worried about it, I would tell you like, okay, I mean, go top of the line, then. Like, you know what I mean? Because you do get like the best of the best when you spend the money for it. But um, is it necessary to have that to win tournaments? No. Um, it just a comfort thing, you know. I mean, what I would say is it is necessary to have something that is middle of the field to the upper end of the field, especially more so than the bait casters. If you're going to spend a lot of money on a combo, make it your spinning combo. That's going to be the one that's going to do the best by you, and that's the one where the drag actually matters, which I can't emphasize enough on the spinning reel. Um, on the bait caster, most of the time you're tightening it down, just wrestling it to the boat, anyways. <laughs> Um, you just want to get something you can cast without backlashing. Um, but the, the the spinning rod and reel, I mean, it's just your bread and butter, right? Like the Senko is a player 50, 60% of the time everywhere you go. So, like, that's what you're going to be throwing it on most of the time on Wacky Rig. I know guys that throw it on a bait caster. I'm not about that life. But um, unless it's, unless it's a, a, a Texas rig Senko, you know, something like that, then I'll throw it on the bait caster. Um, I don't really throw any Texas rigs on a on a spinning rod or reel, you know. It's mostly I'm pretty can, the only thing I really throw, I mean, and again, I've just eliminated a lot of stuff. I mean, you're gonna if you want to get up north in like smallmouth country and like it's real cold, like you could throw a, a finesse hair jig on a spinning rod, you know. Um a drop shot, obviously the biggest thing that I buy model my rod around. Um, and then the Ned rig and a, and a wacky rig, you know, they're like the go-to and that's just all going to in a jerk bait. So they're, yep. they're like some of the biggest winning lures that you're going to have with the exception of maybe the hair jig, um, which is just a random thing for certain times of the year at certain places. But um, I mean, you talk a drop shot, a tanko and a jerk bait. I mean, there's always tournaments being won with them all over the country. It doesn't matter where you're at. So um, in a Ned rig, same thing, you know, um, so they're just in the Ned rig. Also people, you have the, the um, what you mentioned is, it's not just the Ned rig that people think. Um, you tie on uh, like a quarter. You can even go up to like a three eight cents. I'll I'll throw um, Ned rig head, and I'll rig it with like little twin baits, and drag them on the bottom. Or I'll throw like a little fluke style on that same Ned head, and I'll like slow roll like a Nikki rig through the middle of the water column. You know, so um, if they're chasing shad and it's like fall or spring stuff like that, so it's just um, that's where I would definitely definitely looking for is that that's been a rock, you know? no i think that's that's really good too and you, you had mentioned earlier too that you like to have um uh basically uh coverage for all three parts of the water column you know the bottom the middle and the top yeah want to break that down a little bit sure yeah so typically i mean and, and again this is the the biggest thing where they say time on the water is huge it really is because you can take the information I'm giving you right here, which I'll, I'll break down a little bit. And sometimes it won't be the right stuff, you know? So it depends. You got to look, is it the fall? Is it the spring? Is it the winter? Is it small mouth? Is it a large mouth? Is it a reservoir? Is it like a highland reservoir? Is it like a river? Or is it going to be like a grass lake? Like all that stuff drastically changes these things. But speaking to like a highland reservoir or like a small mouth lake um, up north, I'm going with the water column. Like I'll typically have, um, a Ned rig tied on, right? Or a jig, right? So the two of those things, if you're trying to drag in the bottom are accomplishing the same thing, one might get a bit better than the other one, but you don't need, like, you can go take that same rod and go back and forth between the two of them. Um, and then you have, that's a, that's a bottom contact bait. So that's something if you run into some rock piles or something like that, that you can throw out there and kind of just work it slowly and methodically through the rocks. Um, if you decide you want to be able to do something where, okay, I want to try and get in the middle of the water column, you can throw a jerk bait, something along those lines. Um, and that's where you're going to be able to get those fish that might be suspended up if they're moving around chasing shad or doing something like that. Um, and then if they're really on fire for the shad or they're like in the morning, typically I see this to be the biggest thing is if they're on like a this shad bite, they'll come up in like little necks and choke points um, and they'll be shallower than they're going to be later in the day. Um, and that's when you can throw a topwater lure and pick off those fish. So by being able to go out instead of having – which I got into in the past and having like three different colored chatterbaits tied on. Um, that's probably not going to be the deal, you know? Uh, so some, I mean, for Jody queen, it is half the time. I just saw <laughs> the, um, not for me. And really if I go out and I'm trying to break down new water and find fish, I mean, I'm going to 
make sure that I run into like a rock pile. I'm like, okay, here's a rock pile. I'm going to throw and drag some lures through it. Up and not bite it. So then I see a windblown point. I'll want to throw like a jerk bait over there and something in the middle or, or a chatter bait or a spinner bait um, just to see if I can get one of them to fire up. And then if I see some, like a lot of times, like um, I'll see the top water bite will come on and then it's just like, you'll see something blow up or a ripple and you can throw your top water, which I do find that the top water does get bit okay doing that. But a lot of times when see those little blow ups, on the top water, I'll throw in like a weightless fluke or a sink going that blow up where I'm going to get bit, you know? Um, so that's what I mean. Like you got a Senko, for instance, let's just let's name some baits. It's a weightless Senko, a jig, and then a chatter bait. And then you got a top water and you got a Senko. So there's your five rods that you have tied up and you're able to basically kind of just fish the conditions and like if something happens in the environment there while you're fishing you have something to respond to um and that's kind of the way that i approach it now those particular baits may change but likely they will still be something for all those water columns right now if you're fishing like three feet of water that just simplifies it even more like actually right because you can eliminate like I'm not throwing a drop shot. I'm not throwing a jerk bait. I'm not throwing this. Like, so now you only have to focus on how to cover those three waters. And so I grab a shallow diving crank bait or a lipless and you have a top water lure, you know, and um, that's maybe a different version of a spinner bait or if you want to try something a little bit different, but you can use way less rods now because you're only fishing in that particular volume of water. But when you go to these like Kentucky Lake, we talk about that coming up with the national championship. They opened it up even more. So you're from the Kentucky dam there all the way down to where pickwick spills in so i mean that's like a lot of water you know? a lot of water <laughs> and a lot that's of different like, types of water right i mean oh yeah you got mm -hmm. the headwater spilling in and heavy current down south you got all kinds of creeks and tributaries and there's just all kinds of different stuff so i mean that's a lot of water to cover with a bass boat that you couldn't cover in a couple of weeks you know right. um, so um you, that's where you just gotta try to go through the way i break down tournaments and i'll go on these lakes is you want to look and say, okay, so we have this body of water. It's Gunnersville, for instance, or Kentucky Lake, and it's this massive lake. Um, like, don't try to look at it like I need to fish the north, the south, the mid, this, that, the other thing. Like, try to pick a part of the lake that looks good and, like, go there and fish. Like, that's your tournament lake. Just, like, a one little section of the lake and just try to pick around and break around that particular area and see how you're doing. If not, maybe pick another one of those and move to it. And as opposed to listening to like trying to find spots on the internet and find this and find that um, my map studies turn to basically, I just look at the map, look at what the water is. I use Navionics, Chart Viewer, Google Earth, and those are the things I'll look at. And I literally just try to see stuff like, okay, it's the fall. I think they're going to be chasing bait. They're probably going to be pushing back into Creek Pocket. So I'm going to go into like the Creek Pocket mouths and try to find something. That's where I'll start and I'll work my way out to in on those high likelihood areas. And I'll maybe pick three or four of them and then go around and do it. And then Usually I'll leave one day to like go out in the middle just to see if I can make something happen on the ledges or something out deep. But the most part is just kind of try to simplify it for your mind and don't just go out and try to do everything. Because if you try to do everything, you're not going to do it. It's not possible. <laughs> I've totally done that before, too. My uh, first experience on uh, Kentucky Lake was actually uh, the 2017 KBF National Championship. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed. I was just like, yeah. I don't even know like where to go, where to start, what to throw. Yeah. Because, you know, I had just gotten into kayak fishing like a year before. So sure. I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. And so yeah. like day one, I was like throwing everything under the sun. You know, I had like a little five inch uh, fish finder as a little Lawrence unit and whatnot, you know, and it was cold, uh, it's chilly. I mean, it was like, you know, low 50s, whatnot. And, uh, you know, my, the sides of both of my uh, Hobie Outback were just covered in lures and everything. And so, like, I had to, like, tell myself, I'm like, okay, you're going to put everything away. You're going to take a deep breath. And <laughs> you're just going to look at your fish finder, see what you see, try to understand where the fish are. Look at the things around you. Is there structure? Is there rock? What's around you? And then go from there. And uh, that... That did the trick for me, and I ended up taking a love place that year. <laughs> so, nice, yeah. I mean, Jeez, beginner's awesome. luck, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. No, that's great. But that's the truth. So, like, you literally, you you literally, it, like, 
it may seem like a small adjustment, but by doing that, you literally just kind of like got yourself in that position where like, mm -hmm. um, and what I tell everybody, I mean, you're when you're fishing an event and it's like a, like a hundred or 200 anglers, like if you're finishing in like the top, like 10%, like that's a win for sure. You know, like yes. that's like, regardless, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a lot like first place is like super like random, you know what I mean? Like even for like when I was many tournaments, I fish, like, it's like, they just randomly come when they come, like your goal. And if you're trying to fish tournaments and make like, do it a lot and do things is like, just to finish in that top 10%. If you did that, consider it a win. Like, cause you're, it's, there's a lot of good people out there, a lot of people that can fish and a lot of good competition. And I mean, fishing is a percentage of luck. I mean, what, what is the difference of becoming good and successful in my opinion is if you're finishing in the top 15, top 10, top 15% consistently, and you're getting that consistently good finish, like you're doing the right thing. And then a win will randomly come to you. It's just a matter of making it your time, you know, but um, the consistency is what you're really looking for. So um, I don't go out looking for like the special, like, oh, I'm going to, I need this. Like, I just go out looking, where can I, can do I feel confident catching 85 inches here? You know, like, do, do I think I can catch 85 inches here? And if so, then I'll go fish that stuff. And that's what I do. And I just try to make it happen. And if I can catch more than that, that's great. And I think Jody Queen actually is the one that mentioned that, that I heard and I stuck with me. Um, but that's really what I, I do is I just try to keep up with just making sure that I'm in a spot that I feel confident that I can catch numbers in. Um, and then I just try to stick with that to where it turns out to be a lot of times if you're catching fish, obviously, then you'll end up catching some better ones eventually. And it's just a really a, a good place to start, you know, is just trying to break down one section and not overwhelm yourself. And like I said, don't if you're if you're thinking about the next spot while you're trying to fish your current spot, not even looking at what you're fishing and just blind casting around it stuff like you're not learning anything right like you can roll up and down the bank and then just say, Oh, this sucks. And roll up the other bank and say, this sucks. Well, if you didn't really think about it, like, okay, well, they're just maybe not on the banks. You know what I mean? Like they just, just <laughs> got, like, rock piles and you go to try and like find some offshore shoals. And that's where you kind of want to look and see what's going on there. Well, we lost Susie there. I'm not sure what happened to her, but she should probably be back in. Yep. There she is. Whoop. Hey, Susie, welcome back. Yes. I don't know what happened there. I don't know what happened either. Sorry about that. <laughs> all good. All good. <laughs> um all right well um we we just hit our hour mark so um we definitely covered a lot of good stuff there any um last uh tips you would think like if you were introducing someone to uh the sport what uh any any final kind of uh advice or anything you would give them yeah fun, have fun number one you know what i mean like enjoy yourself on the water like don't do it to make money because look, it's not going to happen. Like you can maybe win a tournament here or there, but you're probably not going to ever be profitable fishing in a kayak. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, there's very few people. I mean, that win a lot of tournaments. I don't know. Your back wall is uh, proving you. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I mean, even that though, you still break even you, you, or you, you maybe make a couple thousand dollars or extra a year, you know, like on a good year. Um, but don't, don't try to get caught up in like the money thing about it. Like I, I've chased trophies and checks. I tell everybody, like, I don't really care about what the money actually is just cause I like try to do well and I just enjoy the competition and being out there. But the biggest tips I can give you is one, go out, have a good time, get yourself like three rods and get some techniques that you're really confident in fish those um, spend some time on the water, you know, like research of maps is, is important. Do it on like Google earth and stuff like that ahead of a tournament to get yourself a plan. Um, don't get caught up in the plan. Like, like Susie mentioned earlier, like just pay attention to your graph electronics, <laughs> try to find something a little bit on like, look, okay, I'm fishing rock. Okay. I'm fishing cracks. Just be aware of the moment of where you're at mm -hmm. and you're fishing and don't, don't get yourself spun out. And, uh, just remember you're there trying to have a good time and have fun and, and worst case scenario, you know what I mean? If you're, if you're not winning, you're learning, you know, that was a John Cruz statement, I think. So, um, but that's uh, the best thing I can tell everybody is just, like I said, go out, have fun, do as much research as you want. It's, it's unlimited. It's, it's as much time as you want to put into like watching pod, listen to podcasts and watching YouTube videos and doing everything. But um, the biggest learner is going to be yourself getting out in the water and just trying to play around with some comfort, comfort, confidence baits and, um, get those things together, say, okay, this is my bottom bait that I feel confident. In. This is my midwater bait. I feel confident in my jerk bait. I feel confident in and get that in like a couple different colors, you know, like a dark, a light and like a, maybe like a matte color and, um, just have one of each of those for like a jerk bait, that's chatter bait or a spinner bait. You don't even really need both of them. Just one of them, you know, and then, um, like a, a, a Senko obviously. And then like a drop shot, if you're fishing around, like, like some stuff, like you can like throw a little robo worm or a, like a flat worm or something like that, you know, and just keep it simple, go out, pay attention to what you're doing, just have fun and 
enjoy yourselves, you know? Cool. Awesome. Oh, I think that's good advice. So, uh, well, Ryan, again, I wanted to give you a chance to shout out um, one where folks can find you on social media or any place else that, uh, you know, you want to throw out there. We'll make sure we include it in the show notes too, for anybody who, uh, uh, might be listening and doesn't have time to write it down or anything. Um, we'll put links and everything to the show notes. Um, so uh, where can people find you? Sure. So on Facebook, it's uh, at Ryan Matalevich. And then Instagram is the same thing. I mean, it's not the easiest name in the world, I'm sure. So I apologize for that. Um, but uh, it's just my name, which they can spell it out for you. Um, it's Ryan, R-Y-A-N. And the last name is Matalevich, M-A-T-Y-L-E-W-I-C-Z. And if any of you guys have any questions or anybody, don't feel f- like a weird at reaching out, like send me a message. I, I respond to people all the time and I'm happy to kind of answer and help people out. And like I said, I do it for fun. Um, I run an excavating company. That's like where I make my money. And then nice. uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't make it fishing. I may, I do well, but it's, it's just, I, I don't mind how I, I, I really get more enjoyment out of helping people out than anything else. And um, feel free to reach out to me and uh, I'd be happy to help you out with any kind of insight, whether you have like a question on trying to select a rod or a reel or, any advice, I'd be happy to just try to steer you in the right direction instead of trying to sell you to some sort of sponsor post, you know? <laughs> so, and then it, getting to sponsors, <clears throat> I, I am on the uh, Old Town Pro team, so um, with Johnson Outdoors. Um, so I want to thank those guys. They do a lot for me. Um, I'm in the autopilot, which not just because it's my boat, I truly believe is a super stable kayak. So if you guys are looking for something that's stable, they're not the fastest kayaks in the world, um, but they are super super stable and you'll feel really safe out there i mean i go out in three or four footers on big lakes and i'm completely confident i actually can fish more diligently like or more like safely than i do in my opinion on my 21 foot bass boat so um i just feel more confident and they are just really good kayaks and then my other sponsor would be dakota lithium which is what powers mine i run the i run two 135 amp hour batteries on my kayak um i have a lot of electronics and i also have um a lot of water that i cover so i mean <laughs> people say oh you know i run on 10 pretty much all the time i'm running and gunning looking for different stuff <laughs> better chasing right so you find a spot here and then you move to the next one and there's a lot of water you got to cover so um you burn up a lot of battery running on 10 like like i do i mean i covered 10 miles of tournament so um oh, yeah. Dakota does a great job keeping you running um stormy's great to work with and um something that's big that i always tell people is support who supports you you know like and uh dakota lithium does more for the kayak industry um as far as from a lithium battery standpoint than anybody else out there um so give back to those guys they do a lot to try to give giveaways i mean you can think about how many tournaments you're at where they've raffled off or give away a, a dakota lithium battery and um that means a lot and so give back and support the guys that are kind of giving to your support you know Definitely, definitely. Um, after all this, hearing you talk about the different waters that you fished, uh, knowing you, uh, you know, live pretty close to the Susquehanna, w- would you say w- uh, you're more of a river? Like, where, w- if you could choose where you're going to fish, would it be the river or would it be somewhere else? No, Lake Ontario is my place. That's okay. where I like okay. yeah. Well, uh, you said you like uh, drop shots so and, <laughs> and smallmouth, so that yeah. kind of sounds like uh, you know. You, catch you can catch you. Can, well, you wanted to originally talk about swim baits. You can catch them on big swim baits right now in Ontario. They're like they're, oh. they're they they kind of switch off the off the drop shot thing in the fall, and they stop chasing the the goby as much, and they start like chasing a lot of perch. And I mean, I've literally caught like six pound smallmouth up there oh. that have stood up like like full on like nine, 10 inch perch. Like, <laughs> wow. Oh my God. Oh. Like, yeah, they have that in their mouth. And they're still eating like, like other baits, you know, and, <laughs> but, though you can catch them on big, <laughs> big, big swim baits. So you can catch them on little like kai techs, Like I mentioned on a spinning rod up there with just like a little Ned rig dragging like a kai tech on the bottom. And um, it's just an awesome place to fish. It's if you guys haven't been up there, it's a spectacular fishery to check out. So that's nice. a bucket list for me for sure. Mm-hmm. So. Definitely. That's a place to go for personal best for sure. I will tell you that. <laughs> I got mine at St. Clair, man. That oh my god, that smolly was stupid. It was like taller fat wise than my hand. It was yeah. insane. It, it makes it tough. It makes it tough when you go up there and fish because I mean, it was. I think it was my first time up there on a boat with my buddy. Um, we just went up there and ran around, and um, I think we had it was like twenty eight five or something was our best five fish um on smallmouth you know and that was that was actually during the toyota series last year was going on up there and um i was like man i guess i should have put a tournament <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's just you literally can't go up there. I mean, i've been up there maybe like 
in the past two years like six times and i think like we've gotten a six pound plus mom out every time we've gone up there so. oh, holy cow that's awesome God, that's awesome all right man well thanks again so much for coming on uh appreciate you taking the time definitely good information for people uh you know breaking down how to get started and kind of you know a, a good place to start with the three rods and uh that kind of thing so uh appreciate that and um definitely uh if you're ever down to talk about either drop shotting or swim baiting uh um or i i'm still i need to find someone if you know of anybody i want to talk to somebody about fishing in grass because um that's one thing I, I yesterday i got so frustrated fishing in the grass around me and um i know that's where they are i just don't know how to uh what what best to do to get them out of there so um yeah for smallmouth you're saying yeah 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 i mean that's there, there's there's some stuff i'm i don't know who i would recommend to you probably i'd have to think about it and i'd get back to you and who i'd say was a good grass fisherman i'm not a strong strong grass fisherman um I don't really excel at those Southern lakes, especially at the grass fisheries. As far as the river, I could probably help you out a little bit. Um, but as far as like going to like Southern, like real, real grass fishery, when you're talking about that, like Florida, all that kind of stuff, I still get, I still get, I struggle on that a lot. I mean, when stuff all looks the same and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of it, um, that's, I would definitely not say my strong suit by any means. Um, gotcha. You probably got to talk to a Southern guy for that. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Well, again, thanks so much. Susie, do you have anything else? Um, not that I can really think of. Uh, keep on rocking it, man. You're, yeah. you're doing awesome. Dude. <laughs> I don't know how many walls do you have like in that room? Like, are you going to have to, you know, expand? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. I don't know. I guess maybe, maybe we'll start like, I don't know, like trying to, we just got to get some more first place finishes. I got a couple of them, but I need to get, I need to get some more of those, you know, but top tens, like I said, are, they're, they're, they're still winning. It's just a matter of um, those, those first place finishes. It's just, they're, they're, they just, they're magical when they happen. It's literally like, I don't know. It's like a unicorn, I guess. <laughs> well, you got some ceiling space there. So, you know, we're yeah, I guess you can <laughs> <do>. <laughs> yeah. But All yeah, right. if, you just, if you have anything or you ever want anything or need anything, or if I like, again, anybody needs anything, like as far as questions or just advice or anything, if I could help you, I gladly will. I won't give you any, like, feed you lines of stuff that I don't know anything about. I'll tell you to look elsewhere. But if it's something that I can help you with or something I can give you advice on, I'd be happy to help. Awesome, awesome. Ryan. Well, yeah, thanks again so much for coming on. Um, uh, we'll wrap this up, guys. Thanks again for listening. This has been another episode of Bass Fishing for Noobs, where we bring you the trip that I screwed it up. Techniques, the <laughs> tips, the tricks to help you rip more lips. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you later. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to another killer episode here on Paddle and Fin. Be sure to drop a five-star rating, a thumbs up, or smash that subscribe button on any platform you're listening in on. Be sure to check us out on Waypoint TV, waypointtv.com. Make sure you sign up for the Fantasy Kayak Fishing League at paddleandfin.com forward slash fantasy. You could support this show through Patreon, patreon.com forward slash paddleandfin. Don't forget to check out the website, paddleandfin.com. Catch us on YouTube. If you got a question, comment, or want to see a future guest on the show, be sure to email us at paddleandfin at gmail.com. Shout out to our show supporters, Yak Gadget. You can check out all the fine kayak accessories at yakgadget.com. Pelican Professional. For all your cases, coolers, and lighting needs, go to pelican.com. Rocktown Adventures your midwest premier paddle sports destination go to rocktownadventures.com eastport marina the beautiful destination on dale hollow lake if you're looking for lodging kayaks kayak accessories or anything fishing related on the beautiful dale hollow lake go to eastport.info and jig masters jigs when in doubt get the jig out go to jigmasters.com and fill your tackle boxes today